Keep your Bibles open to Luke chapter 4, verses 38 through 44. That will be our text this morning. And the title will be taken from Jesus' words in verse 43. For this cause I was sent. For this cause I was sent. The last time we were in Luke together, we studied the account that we have in Luke 4 of Jesus delivering the demon-possessed man in the synagogue of Capernaum on the Sabbath day. Our text this morning, again Luke 4, verses 38 through 44, tells us what happened next on that Sabbath day and the day that immediately followed. Now in this text, we have an account of Jesus performing many miracles of healing and deliverance. We also see the people of Capernaum make a mistake about Jesus and his ministry. And finally, we have the words of Jesus, where he tells the people of Capernaum that he must carry his message to other cities. So the miracles, the mistake, and the message. Let's pray before we begin. Lord, I pray that as we open up your word and we study this passage together, again, Lord, we pray for the quickening of the Holy Spirit. We pray that you would convict us of your, from your word of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. Lord, may we who are believers gathered here this morning, may we be further conformed into the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, as we examine ourselves before your word. And Lord, if there's any here who are not believers, we pray that you would do a convicting work in their hearts and lives this morning, we pray. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, first let's examine the miracles that we see in this text. Verse 38 tells us that after Jesus delivered the demon-possessed man in the synagogue, he left and went to Simon's house. This is Simon Peter, referred to as Simon in this text. And so he went to Simon's house. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was sick. Luke, the physician, tells us that she had a great fever, a great fever. This is the Greek word megas, where we get, of course, our English word mega. It was a terrible fever that she had. And even today, with all of our modern medicine, a high fever is a very dangerous situation. Simon's mother-in-law, she was in a precarious position. Her life was in danger. Those around her were fearful for her and for her safety. Now, the end of verse 38 tells us, they besought him for her. They besought him for her. Those who were present there in Simon's house They asked Jesus to help. Jesus had just delivered a demon-possessed man who, as far as we know, was a complete stranger to him before meeting him there in the synagogue of Capernaum. And if Jesus would help him, certainly these who were in Simon's house had hope that Jesus would help them. God's faithfulness in the lives of others gives us hope and assurance that he will be faithful in our lives as well. And the first part of verse 39 tells us what Jesus did. There in verse 39, we're told, And he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. Jesus demonstrated in the synagogue earlier that he had authority to rebuke spiritual forces of oppression when he delivered that demon-possessed man. And here in Simon's house, Jesus demonstrated that he had authority over impersonal forces as well. Nothing in the created world could violate the command of the Creator. Jesus rebuked the fever, and it left. It had no power to stay. Now look at what happened to Simon's mother-in-law. The end of verse 39 tells us, And immediately she arose and ministered unto them. I'm sure most, if not all of us, can remember a time when we had a fever. We were sick, but eventually that fever broke, and we could feel that we were no longer uh, fighting that fever, that our body was no longer having that fever. But when that fever broke, we were not immediately whole. Having a fever, being sick like that, it saps our strength. It takes time for our physical bodies to recover. But that's not what happened when Jesus healed Simon's mother-in-law. He didn't just happen to be praying over her when the fever broke. This was a miraculous healing, and she immediately was made whole and restored to her former strength. Jesus rebuked the fever. The fever left, and she immediately had the strength to get up and to minister to those who were there. 
But of course, we know the miracles don't stop with just the healing of Peter's mother-in-law. Verses 40 and 41 tell us of many more miracles that Jesus worked at that time in Capernaum. Verse 40 begins, Now when the sun was setting... The setting of the sun marked the end of the Sabbath day for the Jews. And because of the customs of the Jews, any sort of labor on the Sabbath, even a labor of mercy, such as bringing the sick to Jesus for healing, would not have been allowed. Later on, in Luke chapter 6, verse 7, we're told, the scribes and Pharisees watched him, that is Jesus, whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. But now that the sun has set here in Capernaum on the Sabbath day, there is freedom from these customs, and so the people bring their sick to Jesus to be healed. Now the language that's used in verse 40 gives us some idea of the scope of this healing ministry. Verse 40 says, Now when the sun was setting, all they that had any sick with diverse diseases, all any, diverse, very broad language that's used to describe this group of people. There were sick people here of every sort and description. Now what does Jesus do? Here are all these sick people that are brought to him. And so verse 40 tells us that there were assistants present at this healing crusade who screened the sick people who arrived and chose a select few, maybe uh, some of the easier cases for Jesus to try to heal. Not at all. Not at all. Maybe it says that he laid hands on every one of them and healed some and sent others away still looking for healing. No, again, it's not what it says. The end of verse 40 says he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. On every one and he healed them. Now, in this account, Jesus healed every sick person who was brought to him that, this evening. There were no cases that were too difficult. No one was turned away. No one was told that their faith was insufficient for healing. No one left partially healed. This evening in Capernaum, Jesus laid his hands on every sick person brought to him, and they were healed. This was a time of great spiritual deliverance as well as physical deliverance. Verse 41 tells us, and devils also came out of many. Devils came out of many. Now we're not told that any of the sick who were brought were demon possessed, but that's of course a possibility. It may have also been that there were others in the crowd that had gathered there that were demon possessed. But either way, there were many that were there, that were demon-possessed. And again, Jesus demonstrated that he had both the power to heal and the power to deliver. That evening in Capernaum, there were many who were set free from demonic possession. And verse 41 also tells us that they made confessions very similar to the demon in the synagogue earlier on in this chapter. Verse 41 tells us, They cried out, saying, Thou art Christ, the Son of God. Christ, of course, means the anointed one. You are the anointed one. Christ, the Son of God. Now, whatever the motive of the demons may have been, we know for sure that it was not love for Christ or submission to him which led to these confessions. Jesus, as he had before, he silenced their testimony, just as he had in the synagogue. He rebuked them, suffered them not to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. Again, these demons were not motivated to make this confession out of love for Jesus or submission to him. And Jesus had no common cause with demons. He had no need of their testimony, and so he rebuked them. Jesus would not allow them to speak. And we see in this again the authority that Jesus had over these fallen angels. Well, we've seen the miracles of Jesus here in Capernaum. Jesus delivered the demon-possessed man in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He went to Simon's house and healed Simon's mother-in-law. And then that evening, he healed all the sick who came to him. And he cast out many demons. This was a day filled with miracles. And the beginning of verse 42 tells us, And when it was day, so that is the day after the Sabbath, 
he departed and went into a desert place. Jesus left Capernaum and went to an uninhabited area. And here we see the people of Capernaum made a mistake. The people of Capernaum, they wanted Jesus to stay in their city. Look at the second part of verse 42. It says, The people sought him and came unto him and stayed with him, that he should not depart from them. The people of Capernaum woke up and discovered that Jesus was no longer in the city. The night before, there had been this time of incredible healing. This exciting time there in the city. And they woke up. And you wonder what they were thinking. What's a new day going to hold? Yesterday was so incredible. What might a new day hold? Maybe you can think of a time as a child where you had a fantastic day. And you went to bed very excited. And you woke up the next day. And you were just as excited again. Because it was another exciting day. And who knows what the day would hold? Who knows what would happen? And who knows what was going through the minds of these people of Capernaum? But they woke up and they sought for Jesus. They sought for him. They found that he was missing and he was no longer in the city. And so they sought him. They went looking for Jesus. They wanted to find Jesus. And when they heard where he was, they came on to him. They were not merely curious about his location. They used this information, and they went where they could find Jesus. They sought him. They came unto him. And this verse 42 tells us, they they stayed him. They stayed him. This is the word, kadeko. And it means to hold fast, to possess, to seize. The people of Capernaum did not want Jesus to leave And they meant to keep him there with them. In Nazareth, we saw the people thrust him out of their city. But in Capernaum, they tried to pull him back in. Now, in one sense, this is a good desire. And we can commend their attitude and even profit from emulating them. Like the people of Capernaum, we should seek Jesus. This should not be a vain seeking. It should not just be an idle curiosity about Jesus. Like the people of Capernaum, when we learn where Jesus can be found, we should come unto him. Don't be satisfied merely with knowledge about Jesus. Seek the presence of Jesus in your life. Come unto him in salvation, and then walk with him in faith and obedience. And also, we should hold fast to Jesus. Once we are with him, we should never want to leave. The same word <clears throat> is used in Hebrews 10, verse 23, where we're told, let us hold fast the profession of faith without wavering. Jesus is the object of our faith. And let us hold fast to him and never let go. Now again, in some ways, the attitude of these people towards Jesus was commendable. But they made a mistake. And here was their mistake. They wanted Jesus to stay with them instead of them staying with Jesus. Jesus called upon his hearers to forsake all and to follow him. But they did not want to leave their city to follow Jesus. They wanted Jesus to stay with them in their city. They wanted to pull Jesus back to stay in the city. Now why? What was their motive? Did they want Jesus to stay because of the truth that he taught and preached? Or did they want him to stay because of the miracles that he worked among them? Now, this text doesn't tell us. This text does not uh, reveal the motives of the hearts of these people at this time. But Jesus does later comment on the spiritual condition of the city of Capernaum. In Matthew chapter 11, verses 23 through 24, Jesus said of Capernaum, And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which had been done in thee, which have been done in thee, had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. But I say unto you, that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. This is a very strong rebuke from Jesus very sobering words from Jesus about the people of Capernaum. They had so much revelation given to them. 
They saw so many signs and wonders. They had so many opportunities to repent. And yet as a whole, they did not. Jesus warned that the day of judgment would be worse for them than for Sodom. Now all sin is terrible and worthy of God's judgment. The Bible is abundantly clear on that. But among the greatest of sins and among the most worthy of judgment is the sin of rejecting revelation of Jesus Christ. And you who are here this morning are in an even better position than that of the people of Capernaum. They saw signs and wonders, but you had the testimony of the Word of God. And you might say, well, give me signs and wonders. Then I will believe. You know, this is the same thing that the priests, the scribes, and the elders said when Jesus hung upon the cross. In Matthew 27, verse 42, they said, If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. They had already seen signs and wonders, but they wanted just one more, and then they would believe. A great Old Testament example of this same issue is King Ahab. Think of all the signs and wonders that King Ahab saw, and yet he did not believe, did not repent, would not obey God. Are you better than they? The rich man in Luke 16, he asked Abraham to send Lazarus to warn his brothers that there was a place called hell, and they were bound for this place of torment. And do you remember what Abraham said? They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. They have the Old Testament. Let them read the Old Testament and believe. And the rich man replied, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And in Luke 16, verse 31, Abraham said, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. One did rise from the dead as a testimony for us, Jesus Christ. And we have more than just Moses and the prophets. We have the complete word of God. Don't commit the sin of these people of Capernaum who rejected Jesus Christ. See your sin, repent, and flee to Jesus Christ for salvation. Jesus said in John 6.37, <clears throat> All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So far this morning, we've seen the miracles that Jesus performed here in Capernaum, and we saw the mistake made by the people of that city. <clears throat> they wanted Jesus to stay in their city, but they ultimately did not receive him or believe the message that he preached. What was that message? Look at the words of Jesus in verse 42, or 43, excuse me, of our text. In Luke chapter 4, verse 43, He, Jesus, said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. Jesus said, I must preach to other cities also. And Jesus did not say, I must go and do miracles in other cities also. No, Jesus said, I must preach. And here again, we see that the primary ministry of Jesus, while he was here on earth, <clears throat> was not his miracles, but his preaching. His miracles were subordinate to his preaching. Now, sometimes we get strange ideas about miracles that are not grounded in Scripture. When we look at miracles in the Bible, we find that God did not perform miracles just for the sake of miracles. There are three main words used in Scripture to describe miracles. Signs, wonders, and miracles. Now these signs, wonders, and miracles, they're given to authenticate agents of divine revelation. There are three major periods of miracles in Scripture. We have Moses in Egypt and the wilderness. We have the ministry of Elijah and Elisha in Israel. And we have the ministry of Jesus and the apostles. Now there were other miracles in the Bible, but these are three main periods of miracles. And the signs and wonders performed by these individuals were given by God to authenticate these men as his agents of revelation. Now, it's also important to realize that something which appears to be a sign, a wonder, or a miracle by itself is not instructive 
nor is it proof of divine authority. God warned the Israelites about this in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, <clears throat> and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them, thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. So you have to be careful when we're examining miracles in Scripture. Now, why does this matter? But when we study the life of Jesus, we might be tempted to major on the miracles and minor on the message that he preached. But we must remember that the miracles Jesus performed, they served the primary purpose of authenticating his message. Jesus didn't perform miracles for the sake of miracles. He didn't heal everyone all the time, although he certainly had the power to do so. He didn't feed everyone all the time, although he demonstrated he had the power to do so. His miracles supported his preaching ministry. And when a miracle would not further his message, or even if a miracle would have hurt his message, Jesus would not perform miracles. And we see several examples of this as we continue in the study of Luke. And so Jesus told the people of Capernaum, I must preach. And Jesus also said, in other cities. Now, as I was, as I was studying these words, a city in Samaria came to mind. The city of Samaria came to mind. Now, we have in Scripture an account of a man who lived in Samaria, a man who worked signs and wonders among the people of that city. This account is found in Acts chapter 8, and the man's name was Simon. We referred to him as Simon the sorcerer. The Bible tells us that he used tricks of sorcery to fool the people of Samaria. He presented himself as some great and important person. Everyone in Samaria respected and honored him. The people of Samaria said, This man is the great power of God. The people held Simon in high regard as he had been in Samaria for a long time. And then, of course, as Acts tells us, Philip came and preached the gospel and Simon's power over the people of Samaria was broken. But this account of, of Simon the sorcerer stood out to me. It gives us an opportunity to compare a genuine to a fraud. Simon used sorcery, but Jesus rebuked and would receive no testimony from that which was demonic. Simon presented himself as a great and important person. Jesus, in contrast, humbled himself and came to earth as a servant. Simon found a city where he and his tricks were well received, and he stayed there. He didn't go anywhere else. Why take the risk? He had a good thing going in Samaria. But Jesus left a city where he was initially well received and wanted, because he was not here to build an earthly kingdom with signs and wonders, but a heavenly kingdom by doing the will of the Father. Simon tried to make people believe that he was the great power of God, but Jesus actually came and was the great power of God incarnate. So Jesus said, I must go to other cities also. And Jesus also said what he must preach. He said, I must preach the kingdom of God. This phrase, the kingdom of God, is used over 30 times in Luke's gospel. And this is the first. And what is the kingdom of God? The kingdom is God's reign. God exercising his divine kingly authority. God the Father has given authority to the Son, and He will exercise this authority until He has subdued all that is hostile to God. It's talked about in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 through 28. Now the object of this rule is the redemption of men for the glory of God. We're told in Scripture that there is a hostile kingdom opposed to God's kingdom. Earlier on in this chapter, in verse 5, the devil boasted of his power in the kingdoms of the world and was even so bold as to offer this power to Christ. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus refers to demonic possession as part of God, or Satan's kingdom among men. In 2 Corinthians, verses, or 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 through 4, we have a summary statement of the conflict between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. 
2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 through 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. And entrance into the kingdom of God, it means deliverance from the power of darkness. Colossians 1, 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And the kingdom will come at the end of the age in its ultimate fulfillment. Jesus will return in glory. He will sit on the throne of judgment. The wicked will be condemned and the righteous will inherit the kingdom. Spoken of in Matthew 25. But the kingdom has also come into history in the person and work of Jesus Christ. The redemptive rule of God invaded the kingdom of Satan and now delivers men from the power of sin. In Luke 11, verse 20, Jesus asserted the presence and power of the kingdom when he said, But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. One day Satan will be destroyed. He'll be cast into the lake of fire, tormented forever and ever, as Revelation 20, verse 10 tells us. But Satan is already defeated. The kingdom of God has come into the hearts of men and women through the person and work of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is also supernatural. The divine kingly authority belongs to God and God alone. Only the supernatural power of God can bring the kingdom of God. Only God can destroy Satan and redeem men from the power of sin. We as men, we can preach the kingdom of God. Jesus sent out the 70 and told them to preach, The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. Luke 10, verse 9. In Acts 8, 12, we're told that Philip went to Samaria and preached the kingdom of God. The book of Acts ends by telling us that Paul spent two years in Rome under house arrest, and there he preached the kingdom of God. We can persuade men about the kingdom. In Acts 19, 8, And he, Paul, went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. We can reject and refuse to enter into it. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 13, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. We can look for the kingdom of God. We can pray for its coming. We can seek for it. But we cannot bring about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God works in and through men, but it is altogether God's work. It's God's doing. Now here come the people of Capernaum. And Jesus, they say to Jesus, come back with us. Stay with us. We don't want you to leave. But Jesus told them, I must. I must go and preach the kingdom of God in other cities also. And notice Jesus says, For therefore am I sent. Jesus would preach the message and finish the work the Father had given him. He had been sent for this work, and he would not turn aside from it. This chapter ends with verse 44 telling us, And he preached in the synagogues of Galilee. Now in our text this morning, we have seen a very clear statement from Jesus about the purpose of his ministry. Jesus told the people of Capernaum that he was sent to preach the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God has come to us. We have the same opportunity and the same responsibility to receive it, just as the people of Capernaum had. Don't make the mistake that they made. Don't reject the Lord in the face of such incredible revelation. And as Christians, here we see again the responsibility that we have to be faithful in serving the Lord, be faithful in doing all that we're commanded to do, advancing the kingdom of Christ. We realize this is a work that only God can do. And may we have the same passion for it as Jesus had, refusing to be turned aside from the work that the Lord has called us to. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you 
for your word. We thank you for the testimony of your word. We thank you, Lord, for inspiring it and preserving it for us. We thank you, Lord, for the position that we have of such tremendous revelation being available for us at our fingertips. And we live in such a, such a rich time where we can open up your word and read it and study it. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to be faithful with this incredible gift. Lord, may we not be like so many of those we see in Scripture who were given tremendous revelation and then wasted it, who did nothing with it. Lord, may we first receive it by your grace and salvation, and then may we continue to receive it and apply it in our lives that we may bear much fruit for you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.